This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. No summit. President Trump calls off the meeting with North Korea, sending geopolitical shockwaves through the market. Going up, that's where gas prices are headed, and some say that could hurt already weakening home sales. Disrupting the economy, technology is fast changing the way we work and live, and that's making Federal Reserve officials a bit nervous. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Thursday, May the 24th. And good evening, everybody, and welcome. Investors were caught off guard when the White House said the highly anticipated summit with North Korea was canceled. The news pulled down the major indexes and injected new uncertainty into the market, something Wall Street doesn't like. As stocks moved lower, gold prices, considered a safe haven for investors, moved higher, as did the defense stocks. By the close, the Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 75 points to 24,811. The Nasdaq fell one point and the S&P 500 was down five. Eamon Javers has more for us tonight from the White House. A dramatic setback in negotiations between the United States and North Korea over that country's nuclear program. The president today announcing that the United States will not participate in the scheduled summit with North Korea on June 12th in Singapore. The president citing recent comments from North Korea insulting the vice president and also some saber rattling from the North Korean side. The president said that the United States military is prepared to act now if necessary. I've spoken to General Mattis and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and our military, which is by far the most powerful anywhere in the world, that has been greatly enhanced recently, as you all know, is ready if necessary. The president also suggested that he has talked to the South Koreans and the Japanese, and they stand ready in terms of their military as well. And he also suggested that he had an agreement from both countries to pay for the financial cost or much of the financial cost for any military action that happens on the Korean Peninsula in the weeks and months to come. The president ended his remarks at the White House today, though, on a more optimistic note, suggesting that the summit could still happen, could be re-added to the schedule, and also urging Americans not to be anxious about all of this. And hopefully everything's going to work out well with North Korea, and a lot of things can happen, including the fact that perhaps, and would wait, it's possible that the existing summit could take place or a summit at some later date. Nobody should be anxious. We have to get it right. The South Korean side, meanwhile, expressing some ambivalence about all of this. They had suggested earlier in the week that there was a 99.9 percent likelihood that the summit would take place. Now that it's canceled, there is some anxiety on the Korean Peninsula about what happens next. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Eamon Javers at the White House. Now, as Sue mentioned, after the president called off the summit, safe haven plays began to rally, most notably bonds and gold. Are they good buffers to all the geopolitical uncertainty we're seeing right now, and do they belong in your portfolio, therefore? Joining us tonight, Bill Stone, Chief Investment Officer at Stone Investment Partners. Bill, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Seems the last few years we haven't seen much of a safe haven play amidst all the geopolitical uncertainty, but we did today. Why do you think that is? You know, I think today was one of those mixes of the geopolitical and also this particular geopolitical with North Korea involved also kind of drags China in there, too. And since, you know, we have the China trade spat, which gets hot at different times, I think it was all mixed up together. And, and that's why you got, you know, gold is definitely one more associated with geopolitical. Um, but, you know, I think you got that. That's why you got that mix of uh, maybe more move in safe haven than we've seen in a while. All right. If this continues to play out uh, the way it did today, if you're not comfortable being in gold, are there other safe haven plays that investors might want to take a look at? You know, certainly if you think this is going to lead to a, a downturn in the economy, so say you think it's going to spark more of a trade war, um, bonds aren't a bad place. I think that's probably the wrong play because I don't think this is going to drag down the global economy. Uh, and if you don't believe that, then yields probably move higher. So it probably doesn't make sense. A weird, I may say a weird, I, I don't know that I'd consider it a safe haven, um, but a place that I think is interesting if you think part of this is, you know, transitory, um, we may still have some geopolitical, but usually the market adjusts to that. 
but you think yields are going to, interest rates are going to move up over time, I do still like the financial stocks. Uh, they've been one of the sectors that has been able to really shrug off higher interest rates uh, and really benefits from them as long as the economy keeps doing okay. What about defense stocks? They rallied today as well. Is that a place you would look? You know, it, it's... It's usually an interesting spot. I mean, the hard part is they've had a very good move, so they're they're certainly not necessarily cheap. Um, but it's it's worth a look in terms of uh, uh, you know long term. They've been uh, you know good performers as well. You know, Bill, you you brought up a good point. You don't think that this is going to escalate, but even if it doesn't, shouldn't you be hedged to a certain extent and have some safe haven or safe haven like plays in your portfolio as part of a balanced approach to the market? You're absolutely right, because I think the worst decision anyone can make is to have to force or, you know, be forced to sell out of stocks at the exact wrong time. I mean, just think back to the financial crisis. You know, if you could have, you know, it was painful, but if you could have lived through it, had enough cash or, you know, some gold or and bonds, for that matter, um, that actually did pretty well or in, well, bonds did very well during that point. Um, you know, you could ride it out. If you can ride it out, we all know stocks, you know, hit new highs again. So, um, the, the really the worst thing you can do is get forced out uh, at the worst possible time. So I think you're right. Always have some safe haven to, to uh, tide you over. Bill Stone with Stone Investment uh, Partners. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks. You bet. Well, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross today said that a probe of car and truck imports is still in its early stages. As we reported yesterday, that investigation could lead to new tariffs on imported automobiles, and it is being conducted on national security grounds. National security is broadly defined to include the economy, to include the impact on employment, to include a very big variety of things that one would not normally associate directly with military security. But it is also the case economic security is military security. And without economic security, you can't have military security. Shares of the Japanese carmakers Honda and Toyota fell today. Toyota says that imposing tariffs could hurt American jobs and increase consumer costs. President Trump today signed into law that rollback of some banking rules. As we've been reporting, a, the bipartisan bill was designed to have the biggest impact on regional banks and mid-sized institutions. It is the most significant change yet to the 2010 Dodd-Frank law, and it will, for example, make it easier for smaller banks to begin issuing mortgages. But the housing market got another disappointing report today. Existing home sales fell in April as buyers contend with a still shrinking supply of homes for sale. And now they're also facing another financial headache. Diana Olick explains. Tammy Washington is tired of the high cost of housing and now the rising cost of gas. The housing prices and then the gas goes up every week. I mean, it was almost a dollar difference a month ago. Higher gas prices are just another negative for homeowners and more so for potential buyers. Home prices were up over 5% in April, according to the National Association of Realtors, while inventory fell over 6%. Mortgage rates are also up to the highest level in over seven years. When you add higher rates and higher prices, the average monthly payment for the median priced home went from $1,072 a year ago to $1,190 today an 11% jump, according to the realtors. With gasoline prices rising, mortgage rates rising, uh, it is burdening the housing costs for people who are living far away from job centers and downtown areas. While the most recent trend has been a return to the urban core, living in the city has become enormously expensive compared to making the trek out to the suburbs or even the exurbs, where home builders are more active, so housing is more affordable. As gas prices rise, they eat away at that savings. I'm planning to relocate and go south where it's more affordable. I can't live just and work just to pay for gas prices. There's no specific data on how higher gas prices affect home sales and home prices, and the impact is likely shrinking given the popularity of hybrid cars and ride shares. But there is no question that higher prices for anything take a toll on consumer confidence. And buying a home, the biggest investment most people will ever make, is all about confidence. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. 
Home builders are having a tough year. The ETF made up of major home building companies is down more than 12 percent year to date, while the S&P 500 has risen 2 percent. So what's weighing on that sector and might that weakness continue? Joining us to talk about that is Will Randow. He's the senior home building analyst at City. Thanks so much for Welcome. joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. So Diana kind of outlined the gas situation, certainly, yeah. but home builders have also been facing inflation in terms of labor costs and materials, right? Yeah, most home builders are experiencing about 5% increases in input costs. Um, thankfully, so far, year to date, they've been able to offset a lot of that pressure through the pricing power that was just previously mentioned in the market. You know, the ultimate question is going to be um, you have a tight labor market, you have rising commodities, particularly lumber prices because of tariffs, for example. Uh, you know, how long does that pricing power stay in place? And do we start seeing a shift in mix towards to lower ASP homes, which is already occurring? Right. Uh, in order to help home builders kind of offset those speed bumps. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I know I'm paying the same for a smaller carton of ice cream these days. So they're going to start downsizing the size of homes as well. Is that the idea? Exactly. Americans buy as much as they can afford. The adage is true and it's been consistent. If you go back to 2000, the average square foot of a new built single family was about 2,000 square feet. Today it's 26, 2,700 square feet. So if you kind of take a step back and think about it, it's mortgage rates are low enough to fund people to have those higher mix, higher ASP homes. And as rates come up, you know, they're, they're going to have to change from a four bedroom to a three bedroom, whatever the case may be. Is, is there a, a specific number on mortgage rates that is a trigger point? I mean, when Bill and I bought our first homes, we were at 16 percent on <laughs> yes. mortgage rates. Yeah. Um, but it seems as though consumers are much more sensitive at, the, at these lower levels yeah. than they have been in the past. I think um, there, there's a number of things to think about. It's, it's really a question of how quickly the consumer gets shocked. If we go back to all the way to 1980, if you have a 51 basis point move in the 30 year uh, or more within a period of a month, Typically, that shocks the consumer and it slows the pace of sales by at least a few quarters. Mm. And we saw that in, I believe it was May of 2013, but I could be off by one year. Uh, we didn't see it this time post the elections when we saw the bump up in the 30 year. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was a bit curious because past precedent would say that we should have a hiccup and it hasn't occurred. Demands remain relatively strong. Do you like the home building stocks? Who, who, who would you like here? We're relatively selective. I mean, we think Lennar is interesting. It's pulled back a bit. Uh, on a relative basis versus the peer set. Um, what's been interesting with the builders is most of earnings ex expectations have held in across the board. What's different about Lennar is it's actually trading in line uh, with the group, meaning the group with small caps. Typically it trades at a premium because it's one of the better operators. It also is absorbing uh, its Cal Atlantic acquisition. Uh, that seems to be progressing relatively well. So we think there's some value there. But we are selective uh, in the type of value we're looking at. We or some other interesting stocks like uh, a land uh, slash master plan community company called the Howard Hughes Corp. Right. Or if you look at the sum of the parts, there's a fair amount of upside there. Um, so basically, we're, we're digging for deeper value uh, in the space. Thank you so much, Will, for joining us tonight. Thank you for we having me. We appreciate it. Thanks, Will. Will Randow with City. Time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades now. Deer's rating was upgraded to buy from neutral at UBS. The analyst says that higher grain prices could increase tractor sales. Price target now $185. That stock was up 1% to $158.18. Apple's price target was increased at Morgan Stanley to $214 a share. The analyst cites optimism over the company's services business. The firm maintains its overweight rating. As a matter of fact, stock was off a fraction today to $188.15. Palo Alto also saw its price target increased to $240 a share at Deutsche Bank. Many expect the company to report a deceleration in product revenue next year. The analyst at Deutsche Bank doesn't think it will be as bad as many expect, however. So the rating remains a buy. The stock is up 1 percent today to 209.15. Darden Restaurants was added to the top picks list at Oppenheimer. The analyst calls the stock's valuation attractive and sees the potential for better than expected earnings. The price target is $105. The stock rose nearly 1.5 percent to 86.95. Still ahead, the big debate inside the Fed that has nothing to do with interest rates and everything to do with technology.
Europe's tough new rules on data privacy go into effect tomorrow. The rules give people more control over their personal data and force companies like Facebook and Google to make sure their data collection operations are safe. The cost of compliance is big, but the cost of not complying is even bigger. And today, a number of tech company CEOs were in Paris attending a major technology conference. And the new rules were a hot topic. Karen Cho reports. This is France's answer to CES in Las Vegas, a technology conference with 80,000 attendees from startups to industry leaders. We need to take a broader view of our responsibility to make sure that we're not just reacting to issues as they come up, but we're out there trying to prevent any issues from, from happening going forward. When we think about the responsibility, let's think about privacy. We will now have to operate recognizing that privacy is a human right. It's our belief that data and AI, it would absolutely, absolutely reorder technology and business. It's a high level turnout from Silicon Valley with the CEOs of Facebook, Uber, Microsoft, IBM and Cisco all keen to tap into the French Revolution on technology, in particular to create an AI hub here in Paris. The US tech leaders are also here as we're about to introduce new European protection laws on data privacy, which carry hefty fines. French President Emmanuel Macron defended the changes and said Europe has it right on regulation. Europe is the right place to, to build this new framework. US is not regulated. Regulation is made by private players. It's not sustainable for our citizens. You will have huge scandals. The French president has previously warned that some U.S. tech companies are too big to govern and should be broken up. He's also lobbied for them to pay more tax in Europe. Many of the tech leaders here have pledged to spend more money on jobs and training centers. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Karen Cho in Paris. Clearly, advances in technology have had a big impact on our economy, changing both the way we work and the skills that we need. But the size and scope of that impact is hard to quantify, even for Federal Reserve officials. Steve Leesman reports for us tonight from Dallas, Texas. Growing disruptions of technology on the economy have reached a level where it's now a major area of concern for the Federal Reserve. Central bankers are confused, intrigued, and maybe even a bit nervous about the potential for new technologies to affect everything from prices to economic growth to the labor market. And they just don't have a handle yet on the pace of change or the scope of change. Because of distributed computing, the cloud, we think that it's accelerating. Consumers have much more technology at their disposal than companies did 30 years ago. And so the impact is the following. Companies have far less pricing power than they have historically. So we think it'll have a muting effect on inflation. We think that needs to be taken into account. And we think it's having an effect on productivity. The Atlanta Fed teamed up with the Dallas Fed here in Texas for a conference titled Technology Enabled Disruption, where they heard stories about new systems where 10 workers are replaced with just two, and where car design that used to take a generation can now be done in hours and be done just as easily in China as in the US. Scary stuff if you're one of the workers in the way of these technology waves. If you're one of 46 million workers in this country that have a high school education or less, you're seeing your job disrupted or eliminated. And you, if you don't get retrained, which is easier to say than do, you may see your productivity level decline. But one of the other stories told is that even high school jobs like engineering can be at risk, where computers can spread knowledge globally that once was held locally by a small, well-paid few. So Fed banks that once focused almost exclusively on abstractions like money velocity and inflation are now deep into the thinking about job training. The only way they have a lifetime of employment going forward is that they have a lifetime of education. They have to commit themselves now to a lifetime of education, constantly refreshing their skills. We will have segments of our society that that's a, that's a situation, whether it's geography or skill set. I'm not worried about it overall because we always create new jobs. What's being discussed here won't bear on the next Fed decision to raise interest rates at the next meeting, but ultimately may be more important. It'll help the Fed determine how much it should raise rates, how low unemployment can go, how inflation might react, and ultimately, maybe most significant, how much the economy can grow. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Steve Leisman in Dallas. Best Buy reports a slowdown in online sales growth. That's where we begin tonight's market focus. 
The consumer electronics retailer also said its profit margins were squeezed by supply chain investments. That overshadowed better than expected earnings and revenue in the most recent quarter. The company didn't update its full year outlook, and that sparked some concerns, so the shares finished down more than 6% to $70.90. General Electric's dividend will reportedly stay intact. CNBC said the conglomerate does not plan to cut its payout next year. Shares yesterday, as we reported, suffered their worst drop in nine years. Today, they were up almost 3 percent to $14.60. Higher costs caused earnings and sales to come in a little light over at Hormel, the maker of Spam, noted higher freight and commodity costs as a factor during the quarter. The stock fell 1 percent to $35.42. And poultry producer Sanderson Farm said today that weaker pricing caused profit and revenue to miss estimates in the most recent quarter. The company said that it expects grain prices to increase in the second half of this year. Shares were off nearly 1 percent to 106.02. Medical device maker Medtronic said that higher sales for its heart valves and insulin pumps helped earnings grow and it topped expectations. The company also gave earnings guidance for fiscal 2019 that was in line with estimates, and shares rose 2 percent today to 86.99. Then after the bell, clothing retailer Gap reported stronger than expected earnings, but that was overshadowed by disappointing results from its Old Navy brand. Old Navy has been a bright spot in past quarters, but not this time. Its sales slowed down and led to an overall miss at Gap. Gap shares were initially lower in after hours tonight erasing a 3 percent gain during the regular session when shares closed at 32.95. And software company Splunk saw earnings surpass expectations. The company said results were helped by an increase in new customers and stronger demand for its products. Splunk also sees revenues this current quarter beating street targets, but still shares initially traded lower in the extended session. They also ended the regular day down a fraction at 116.31. Coming up, meet the woman who, when she couldn't get ahead working for someone else, started her own company. Today, it is worth billions. There are reports tonight that the Justice Department has opened a criminal probe into Bitcoin price manipulation. According to Bloomberg, the investigation is focused on the practice of what's called spoofing, which happens when an investor floods the market with fake orders, intentionally manipulating the price. Federal prosecutors are also working with the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The company that makes those little candy valentine hearts, that's been sold at auction now for more than $18 million. Neko, the 171-year-old candy company, was purchased by Spangler Candy Company, which itself is a 100-year-old company. Spangler is best known for its dum-dum lollipops. Neko filed for bankruptcy last month after being unable to keep up with multinational competitors, in part because of its debt load. So Spangler's purchase of Neko puts some of America's favorite vintage candies under one roof now. As you probably know, there is a national conversation about women in the workplace taking place, and especially in the tech industry. Jane Wells met one woman who broke the gender barrier and is encouraging others to do the same. Finally. 17 years ago, Therese Tucker was a single mother who was chief technology officer at a Fortune 500 company when she had a surreal moment. We had the Circle of Excellence, the Sales Winners Award trip to Hawaii one year. And all of the people walking across the stage were middle-aged white men. And that was the first time I was thinking, you know, my career is probably limited here. Tucker created Blackline, an accounting software company in Los Angeles. I cashed out my nest egg from my options. I maxed out my credit cards. I took out a second mortgage on my house. I had a couple of friends that believed in me. Men? Um, yes, actually. And um, they were the ones that when I needed a payroll loan, I would go and beg them for thirty or forty thousand dollars. Blackline now has nearly 800 employees, 2,400 customers, the best performing tech stock to debut out of Los Angeles in the last two years. Now that she's the boss, Therese Tucker says she's seen firsthand how often men and women are paid differently 
And she thinks part of the problem may be the different ways that certain people negotiate. I've had women who, when they've been promoted, have said, oh, no, no, that's okay, I make enough. And, and that, I think, is much of how the pay gap comes about. I think younger women are getting better. There's things that are paid. Hold on. Along the way, Tucker dyed her hair pink on a dare, calling it the greatest social experiment ever. Like the time after a successful round of funding at a big Wall Street bank, her banker introduced her and her CFO to one of his bosses. And this guy looks over to Mark, my CFO, and says, that's wonderful, congratulations. <laughs> And the banker, it was so funny because the banker very quickly goes, um, and Therese is the CEO. <laughs> and I was like, oh, nice, uh, congratulations, I, I, yes. I think it's important for young women today to see what I've done and to know that it's possible. To know that you can go out and build a business from absolutely nothing through a successful IPO, through life as a public company. Women can do that. She is probably the most under the radar pink haired female founder you've never heard of. But Therese Tucker reluctantly realizes that now she's a role model. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Los Angeles. Good for her. Yep. That does it for us tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Tomorrow's Friday. Enjoy yes. tonight. See you tomorrow.